I think you're, you're doing the mistake of trying to ask a philosopher to be uh, very concise. Uh, I just see like an avalanche of considerations and qualifications and levels um, for each of these very complex questions. Okay. Welcome to Close to the Truth. I'm speaking with futurist visionary Nick Bostrom about his vital, far-sighted, engaging new book, Deep Utopia, Life and Meaning in a Solved World. I loved it. It's an exhilarating romp of ultimate technology centered on AI, how it might work, what it could mean. It's a prescient manual for the future. It's an innovative treatise on the meaning of life. Welcome, Nick. It's great to see you again. Good to see you again. Congrats on Deep Utopia. We'll discuss it in depth. But to begin, I'd like to get your world overview, the, the setting for your book. When we first uh, did our Closer to Truth discussion, I think in Oxford in 2007, 17 years ago, we discussed the simulation argument, fine tuning, anthropic selection, the doomsday argument. How, how would you characterize the last 17 years or so in terms of technological and intellectual development, especially the importance of AI? Well, uh, I mean, it's all happening now, uh, sort of enter the I told you so era. I think the last, uh, especially since 2012, 2014 with the deep learning revolution, I think we've been on a kind of up ramp of AI capabilities, uh, kicking into even higher gear with the release of, uh, chat GPT. And in, in the last two years or so, we've really seen it hit the mainstream where now you know, the White House and key policymakers all over the world are starting to debate the future of AI. So mm. it's a remarkable time. And when did you actually plan this book? Because it's obviously, in essence, the other side of your uh, of super intelligence, 2014, where you were pressing it in warning about the dangers of AI. And so last two years has been a, a high focus on the dangers. And now you've moved on to the to the opportunities. So w when did you have that uh, a, a bit of transformal uh, insight? Uh, I've been working on it for probably around six years or so. It wasn't ever planned. It just kind of happened. Mm. Um, I didn't start out with like some particular set of theses I wanted to defend and uh, elaborate on. I felt an urge to start writing and then it eventually grew into Deep Utopia. Yeah, and I've seen where you've said that the style of the book, which is very unusual, it's a, it's a new literary style involving uh, um, a, a dialogue with, uh, with different characters, uh, your own persona in a, in a, uh, a not, not entirely um, uh, 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 actual form, but uh, in, uh, in, in dialogue with other people and uh, form of a, of a lecture series over a period of a week. Uh, I, I think you've said that whole structure uh, wasn't planned. It was happened organically. Yeah, it's just the way it happened, uh, um, for, for better or worse. But that's, uh, um, I do think the form actually does match the content. It's not a book so much about conclusions as it is a book about questions mm. uh, <clears throat> and helping the reader to start to think about these problems um, and form their own views ultimately. Uh, it's also meant to be not just... Um, something that transmits certain concepts and ideas, but also it's meant to be a reading experience that you might have to work to get through it. But ultimately, I'm hoping it will kind of put you in a better place to reflect on questions about what ought humanity's destiny be. I think that's an accurate description. I, I found myself very engaged. I was looking for more of the uh, arguments as that we've uh, had in the past uh, in, in a very positive sense. Uh, uh, but this book is different. You, you do get the, the, the arc of, our, of various arguments on different things. We'll talk about that. But you, you are brought into that in this engaging uh, intellectual, uh, semi-fictional avatar environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the other benefit of this uh, 
sort of having different characters and different bits uh, is that it makes it easier to explore several different viewpoints, mm. um, which I wanted to do and allow each one to be developed in its own right to its fullest extent and then to kind of collide different perspectives and ideas um, just as, I mean, you're interested in physics, right? So with a particle accelerator, you sort of accelerate little particles to enormous energies and then smash them into one another. And in those extreme conditions, sometimes you can see the basic principles at work that we can then infer are at work all the time in ordinary conditions as well. It's just harder to observe. Mm. And so similarly, this conceit of um, a, a plastic world, uh, a, 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 a condition in which technology has reached its full maturity and, and all practical problems have been solved. It's an extreme condition. But I think we can then see values uh, kind of smashing into one another mm. that, that, that we normally can sort of hand wave and, and they just, because they are mm. obscured by so many practical necessities that, that kind of occupy most of our contemporary existence. Yeah. I, I think that's a very good characterization. Uh, the book is creating an extreme condition and particle accelerators do that in physics. Black holes do that in physics. That, that that's an extreme condition where where uh, people when people study black holes, it's not just for the black holes themselves, but be, it's subjecting the laws of physics to extreme conditions. And you you learn a lot. And I think that's a very good characterization of the book. Yeah. So that's. Um, um, it, it, I think it's like. I mean, for, for, for people who have read it, they will know. But it's not a book that is really. Uh, trying to make predictions, uh, nor is it trying to offer practical solutions to what we should do next. I mean, I've, a lot of my other work focuses on that. Right. This takes basically as an assumption or a postulate, if you want, that things go well in, in order then to be able to ask the questions of what then, uh, what would be the you know, meaning of human existence? What would give us purpose in life? if you know, the whole thing unfolds, like everything is perfect, governance problems is all the AI alignment problem is solved, like all these things, like, but what then uh, would occupy our lives? Um, so sometimes you never actually get to even ask that question because there are so many other questions that kind of crowd in before it. So I just wanted to postulate that and then focus this book entirely on the set of questions that arise in, in this hypothetical future condition. We're going to get into all of it, but let me first give a more formal bio. Um, Nick Bostrom is a professor at Oxford University, where he heads the Future of Humanity Institute as its founding director, uh, with a background in theoretical physics, computational neuroscience, logic, and artificial intelligence. Nick has pioneered contemporary thinking about existential risk, the simulation argument, and the vulnerable world hypothesis, among others. He is the most cited professional philosopher in the world, age 50 or under, and is the author of some 200 publications, including Anthropic Bias, Global Catastrophic Risks, Human Enhancement, and Superintelligence, the prescient book on the dangers of AI. But now we're going to look at the extreme condition if all goes well. So, Nick, your book, Deep Utopia, Life and Meaning in a Solved World. Let's start with a simple definition of what is a solved world and what motivates your focus on it? Um, well, I uh, am referring to a hypothetical condition where basically all practical problems have been solved. So think, first of all, a condition of technological maturity. So we have super advanced AIs. Maybe they have helped us develop all kinds of other technologies, medical technologies, virtual reality, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part of what it would mean for the world to be solved. And then on top of that, uh, we also make the assumption that uh, all the kind of governance problems of the world have been solved to the extent that they can be solved. So we imagine we set aside questions of war and conflict and oppression and inequality and all the rest of it. So, but then there remains a, bi a big kind of problem, which is ultimately a problem of value, which is that under these ideal conditions, um, what kind of lives uh, would we want to live? Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, that's... 
and, and that's uh, and that's a very important way to frame the book because you're not saying all of these problems uh, uh, that are solved are easy to solve or will be solved, but if you do solve it, what does that leave? And it leaves value. Yeah. So one question yeah. that I have is, do you distinguish between meaning and purpose? We use those two terms sometimes interchangeably, but you know, I, I think we, we can we can tease apart a difference. Yeah. You have meaning in the title, but throughout the book, you have purpose as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I think of purpose as slightly, uh, a slightly narrower concept as sort of a, having a reason for uh, doing something or for putting out some effort. Um, and then meaning, um, I mean, that is discussed in the book, but might be a certain kind of purpose or purpose plus something else. Okay. Um, uh, you present, uh, just to give a sense of the environment, a utopic taxonomy um, where you, you have different levels of uh, utopia that can give us a richer understanding of it. Uh, so th th let me just give you the list and just explain each one very quickly. The first is government and cultural utopia. Yeah, this is, um, I think, the most uh, familiar kind of utopia we find in the literature where people imagine a better way for society to be organized. Better political institutions, different schools, you know, maybe different gender roles, but usually set within more or less uh, recognizably contemporary technological context. Uh -huh. So people, people, there's still work that needs to be done and you can organize like how much power the workers have or how the work is divided, but you know, th there have to be people growing food, etc. So that that's like the yeah, the kind of the, the most familiar and basic kind right. of utopia. The first and second level is post scarcity utopia. It sounds like we know what it means, but if you could define it more more clearly. Yeah. So this is the slightly more, I guess, radical um, vision of a, a condition in which hum humans have plenty of all that we need materially. Um, so. To, there, there are these kind of it's more like fantasy in the past but uh, uh various kind of um the, the, the land of cocaine was this uh medieval peasant uh dream basically of some condition where you know the rivers would overflow with wine and roasted turkeys would just <laughs> land on the plate and uh, there would be a kind of continuous feasting and you could easily see how that on its own would have huge attraction if, if you were a kind of, um, you know, agricultural labor who spent your whole life grinding away, barely getting enough porridge to, mm -hmm. to feed your children and your, your joints were aching from all this backbreaking work that you were doing. Then this on itself, just being able to rest and eat as much as you want would <laughs> already be like enough of, of a kind of um, vision. Uh, third level is post-work utopia. Right. So this is the idea that not just is there plenty uh, to consume, but that uh, the production of all this plenty doesn't require human economic labor. Um, and this has started popping up more recently in conversations about the future of AI, where people are wondering, will this advance that we see lead to human unemployment. We can automate more and more things. Um, and if you imagine that running its full course, then you know maybe eventually you could automate almost all human economic labor, and then you would have this post-work condition. The fourth is, uh, fourth and fifth get a little more complicated to understand, but let's, let's do it now. Uh, fourth is post-instrumental utopia. So now we're getting into a more radical conception. Uh, and usually current conversations about these issues stop short before we reach this idea. Right. But if you really think through what it would mean for AI to uh, attain its full potential, and then all the other technological advances that this kind of machine superintelligence could bring about, um, it's not just that we wouldn't have to go into the office and type on word processors or, or like hammer away at uh, construction sites, etc. But also a lot of the other things we need to do in our daily lives could be automated as well. Um, 
So if you think about if you didn't have to work, well, then like typical answers would be, well, you know, I could, you know, maybe some, somebody likes uh, fitness or something. So they, they could spend more time exercising. But like in this condition, you could pop a pill instead and get the same physiological and psychological effects that, you know, spending an hour on in the uh, uh, Stairmaster would uh, provide. And so then why would you really need to go to, would, kind of would lose its point to go to the gym in those conditions? Mm. And, and you can then start to kind of almost do case studies on, on activities that fill our current lives. And for almost all of them, you soon see that they have a certain structure, which is that we do a certain thing, put in some effort in order then to achieve some other thing. Mm. So, you know, you brush your teeth because otherwise eventually you will have tooth decay and gum decay. And so in order to get the outcome of a healthy mouth, you need to spend a few minutes every day brushing your teeth and going to the gym. Um, or you need to, like, you want to understand mathematics, let's say. So then the only way to do that is to put in some effort to study mathematics. And so the effort is motivated by uh, the goal that it is trying to achieve outside the effort itself. Um, and a lot of the things that we are doing um, has that structure. But now if you could get the goal, the end point, without having to put in the effort, mm. then it seems to pull out the rug under the activity itself. It at least is threatened with the sense of being pointless. Um, so and, that, that's the problem you confront in this kind of post-instrumental condition. And so an example of that, instead of studying higher mathematics, you could have an injection of nanobots yeah. that, could, that could analyze every synapse in your brain and then figure out how to change them a little bit so I can understand uh, algebraic uh, geometry or something. Right. That's, that's right. And that, that would be fast and effortless. Um, or even things we do for fun. So there might be various activities that you do uh, because it gives you pleasure and joy. That, that seems like kind of unavoidable. But even there, if you think about it, you could have more direct ways of experiencing the same positive emotions, like a kind of some you know, super drugs uh, that, that could give you the pleasure and the joy without you having to spend an hour gardening or, uh, you know, doing whatever it is that, like watching movies or... So this brings up a very important point of the book uh, in terms of what are our real values, because uh, when I read that, and obviously very intriguing, uh, remarkable way of thinking and, and very, very important, um, I was asking myself, are there any absolute values in a solved world? And so the way to describe it, as you started to say, is if we could take non-harmful drugs or AI neural implants that would maintain a state of perpetual ecstasy, whatever your ecstasy uh, would, would happen to be, or it can, it can switch from a physical bodily ec ecstasy to an artistic ecstasy or intellectual one, and if that could be all done, um, it, it, it is, you know, who could gainsay that? if there's no uh, kind of supernatural value that you would, you would put into it. Um, I, I think that is a fundamental theme of your, of your book about how do we develop the kinds of values if these things are possible. You're not saying these things are uh, remotely in the, in, in the near or mid or even long term, but they are the extreme condition that you talked about, which, which then exposes what is the nature of absolute values, if there are any? Right. Um, now, it is possible that they might be in the long term or even mid or near term, depending on how fast the AI revolution unfolds and what the outcome of that is. I actually think the time scales for radical transformation might be shorter than most people realize if, uh, if, if AI continues to speed ahead. What, what's, your best, what's your best guess on that? Well, um, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, my, my timelines have shortened somewhat, at, at least since this previous book, Super Intelligence, was yeah. published in 2014. Um, I think we are currently looking on timelines that are on the shorter end of the distribution. Uh, so it's hard to say, but I mean, it could be uh, years or maybe a decade or... Yeah, that, that, more, but I mean, at least I think there's a non-trivial probability that 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 we are now kind of on the accelerating uh, slope of this. Mm. But time will tell. 
Okay. Good. Um, and anyway, that that's not central to the book. Even if you thought this would take millions, sure. it would never happen. Sure. It would still. Sure. Uh, uh, right. uh, but there are kind of two ways of thinking about this. You could either just read it as uh, these are perpetual philosophical questions that humanity ponders, and and here is kind of a thought experiment that helps you think about them. Yeah. And I think it's fine. If, if you just read it like that, I, for me, there is also this actual real possibility that we might soon enter a condition like mm-hmm. this, or we might have to make decisions soon um, about what kind of future we want, if we want to steer towards something like this or some other version of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so, th- so there is this kind of underlying practical motivation for uh, for me in, in terms of writing this book, but Good. that's okay. that's optional. Um, so, uh, yeah. I, no, I appreciate that. I, I was more on the former, on the thought experiment, uh, and I would put the put the day in measured in hundreds of years, if not thousands, but uh, to achieve what you're saying. But you know, I'm 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 cautious. I've become cautious as you, uh, and I, I I hear you and respect your view. So I'm I'm a little less sure of what I thought before. Anyway, we we've, we 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 want to get the the fifth category of the um of the utopic uh, taxonomy which you call plastic utopia so even going beyond the post instrumental utopia what is the yeah. plastic utopia um well we alluded to it slightly which is uh, the idea that in addition to uh it having these other properties of being post instrumental in we also in the plastic utopia condition have complete control over ourselves so our mental states, our psychology, our cognitive architecture, our bodies becomes malleable. Um, so it's not just that we imagine human beings as we are now placed in this condition where we don't have to work and where we don't have to put out any effort if we don't want to. We could just press buttons and get what we want. But we ourselves as well become something we can choose. So you wouldn't have to work on yourself uh, to, to build a better character in a plastic utopia if you wanted to instead you could sort of, uh, you know, request of your AI genie to sort of re, you know, rewire your synapses so that you became this different kind of person or to experience pleasure all the time or to become smarter or kinder or wh- whatever else. Um, so that, that makes it even more like uh, solved or dissolved or liquid. Like you enter this yeah. context where everything seems kind of fluid and up for grabs and it's hard to find any sort of firm ground to stand on. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful way of seeing uh, what an extreme condition is, uh, because I I would have not come up with those five. I might have had three or four, uh, but at that level, it really very um, beautifully defines uh, what an extreme condition for for humanity could be in the future, and and therefore gives the book its real real punch. So one issue that you deal with. Uh, especially as you get to all of those is, is the question of boredom um, and, and how much of our value system is based upon the, the need to uh, or, or the lack of control and the uncertainty and what happens whenever this, you know, this is the same kind of problem that uh, uh, traditional religions, both East and West have to deal with, whether you're dealing with uh, Nirvana after the innumerable cycles of birth and, and, death and rebirth and then you reach nirvana or or in the the judeo-christian islamic uh, abrahamic uh, concept of heaven eternal life in heaven i mean th- th- that's a, a, a sort of an end question of boredom that occurs in any of these uh, eschatological ideas yeah it's 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 quite fascinating if you think far enough in this direction you do start to sort of butt up against uh, theological questions, or at least questions that have traditionally been um, discussed in religious contexts about the afterlife, etc. Um, I tried to uh, not trespass onto that terrain in the book. I have this, uh, <laughs> there's this other fictional character, the fictional Bostrom character is giving these lectures. And yeah. then there are, right. sometimes he's asked questions by the students and occasionally he sort of refers to, well, you have to take that up with Professor Grossweiter, which is like another character who doesn't make an appearance in the book, but he's like the theologian or (laughs) the person who could answer their questions on that. Um, But on boredom, yeah, so this is an example where I think it's important to distinguish um, two different senses of, of boredom, which is a subjective sense and an objective sense. So clearly, 
we have a subjective concept of boredom. Like somebody might just feel bored. Um, and that would trivially be uh, easy, easy to uh, abolish in utopia. I mean, it follows directly from the condition of plasticity that this this feeling is like a subjective state of your brain. You could rewire that so that you would always uh, feel you know excited or interested or whatever um, antonyms to boredom you want to use. And um, the the question then is whether there is also some notion of objective boredom or boringness. Um, whether certain activities or experiences are such that they are objectively boring, like meaning perhaps that it would be appropriate to feel subjectively bored if we engaged in them. So if you imagine somebody, um, to take an example actually from the, the, the philosophical literature of, of, of a grass counter, so somebody who spends his life uh, counting the blades of grass on a particular college lawn, we might think, um, that that's a, an activity that is objectively boring. Whether or not he happens to feel excited about it, mm -hmm. it's not appropriate to be really interested in grass counting because it's like too monotonous or insignificant or has some other sort of a deficit. Um, and, you know, philosophers disagree about whether like, you know, one, there is like some kind of firm normative basis for making that, but I think it's an intuition that, uh, you know, some but not all people would have that it would be bad if the future consisted of merely of activities like counting grass, no, no matter how thrilled the people doing the grass counting were. Yeah, so, so that, um, that's an objective value that's kind of is uh, a superset to everything else we're talking about. Yeah, um, potentially. And so uh, if I'm able to, in a plastic world, change my brain to where I enjoy, I am excited about every new grass that I count and what's going to happen at the next number, and I'm genuinely excited about that, and I've I've changed my brain to think, that, and and so subjectively, I'm I'm excited about life, at, at counting all these grasses, or as I think you have in the book, uh, 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 table legs, uh, 200 and some odd thousand table legs, or uh, that, uh, that that potentially is in, in some objective sense is suboptimal. Yeah, that's possible uh, to hold that view. And um, um, now if one does have that view that it would be objection, objectively bad uh, to have nothing in one's life than, you know, counting grass. Um, uh, then that kind of also potentially imposes a constraint on the subjective experience of boredom. Like if it actually is objectively bad to do that, then you might think it would be also bad to change your subjective yes, attitude yes. so that you found great interest in something right. that was objectively boring. So then you might end up with a situation where you couldn't uh, eliminate boredom in the future, neither in the objective or objective sense. Um, and, and so then, so, but so this possibility of the objective value there makes the discussion uh, more complex, like yeah. eliminating the subjective, if that's all there is, trivial, given the postulates. But mm. once you introduce this possibility of the objective, then it becomes a, like a much more intricate conversation to what extent we would be able to do something um, without violating that. Now, I think uh, at least with respect to the value of interestingness um and and there's a bunch of these different values that are kind of related but different but if we focus on interestingness um i think there is at least large scope for increasing the amount of subjective and objective interestingness including in these utopian lives i think even if there is some objective elements to what's boring and what's interesting i think it's uh, has a large zone of indeterminacy um, i mean you can just look at the current uh, human distribution. I, I have a, a good friend and colleague who uh, uh, tells me he's never bored and he's interested in, as far as I can tell, literally everything except sport. Um, <laughs> he, he writes papers on all kinds of topics. He, he knows about everything. He goes to every kind of conference and finds interesting things to discuss with every person. Like It doesn't seem to me that there is anything deficient about his human life. Um, in, in fact, if anything, it, it seems to um, benefit and, and be like a greater person for, for this, this property that he has. And, and obviously that goes down ultimately to some neurochemical idiosyncrasies of his brain that he, um, and I think for all of us, I think 
um, we could expand the range of things in which we take an interest um, greatly before we would reach this point where we would just be counting leaves of grass. Um, moreover, I think possibly it would be appropriate to expand it even further than that. Like maybe if, 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 if we ever reached a condition where we had sort of exhausted all the most obviously interesting things, we had discovered all the really fundamental laws of uh, nature, you know, solved consciousness and like the, the biggest questions had all been answered. Like it would seem perfectly appropriate in that situation to begin to take an interest in the slightly smaller questions. Um, and it's not clear that one couldn't go very, very far in that direction before one reached a point where it would be sort of objectively bad to, to take a further interest. Is religion relevant in a solved world? Uh, yes, potentially very relevant. Although it's also arguably very relevant in the current world. And one might say something more interesting, perhaps, if one looks at some other values that seem not so relevant in the current world, but that could potentially become more relevant in this whole world. I think that um, there might be a lot of uh, subtle values that exist now, but we don't really see them very much, just as we don't see the stars uh, during daytime, because it's like, you know, such a like brighter present uh, and analogously, there are such stark moral imperatives right now, um, calamities uh, of all sorts, you need to take care of your kids, you, you, there are people starving in the world or being shot at, et cetera, et cetera. So, so many horrors um, and, and urgent, obvious, pressing ethical needs to fix things that it would almost be frivolous now to spend too much time threatening a fretting about more subtle, quiet values. But if we ever reached a condition where these pressing needs were taken care of, then I think we might uh, be able to see uh, a whole panoply of, of these subtler values. Like, for example, um, various kinds of traditions that it would be nice to honor authentically. Um, um, ancestors who, you know, maybe we think of our lost parents once in a while, but there's like so many more people who have lived wonderful lives and, uh, you know, maybe deserve more thought and consideration. We, we don't have time. Our daily lives keep us busy. But if you didn't have that, why not? Um, various aesthetic qualities. You could imagine making your life more into a kind of artwork where every relationship was uh, not just a source of, I don't know, relaxation or fun or satisfaction, but also something actually beautiful that you were kind of constructing together, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And we don't now have the luxury to kind of really develop a, a fine sensibility for those. But I think it would be entirely appropriate uh, it, it, once the urgencies are removed to, to sort of tune up, like almost like our eyes dilate at night, right? So it can take in more light. Mm. Uh, similarly, in this condition, our moral sensibilities and sensibilities for subtle values, I think, should dilate. And this is a larger definition of religion as we might uh, have it in today's world, uh, enabled by the, the, the solved world, that the, uh, the boundaries of religion become broader. Yeah, potentially. Uh, but again, um, it, it also potentially is very important today. So it might be one of those things that is very urgent today, even with other urgencies pressing in upon us. Mm. Like many religious people would say that, yes, you, you have all these practical things you should do, but you should also set aside time for worship, et cetera, even though it conflicts with, um, but, but even more so, obviously, in this condition. And uh, um, I mean, we would be more like, uh, I guess, potentially like monks and nuns that have the time to fully <laughs> devote themselves to contemplating the uh, divine. When I first heard of the book and started it, um, I, the first question, one of the first questions came into my mind is how does a solved world, the, the Bostrom solved world, articulate with the uh, Marxist pure communism? Um, and as I started to go through the book, uh, to me, that question became pretty obvious that the, the, the there would be a high correlation potentially between the first at least two of the utopia taxonomy uh, levels, the government and culture, and then the post-scarcity, and then maybe into the post-work as well. But 
pure communism as it's been envisioned in the past or even in the, in a few cases in the present uh, doesn't even deal with uh, points four and five. Right. And, and I mean, they, I think I, I, I'm not really a Marx scholar, but I think he just has a few lines really about what would, you know, ultimately be the outcome of if the whole communist project succeeded. And I think he, he refers to this, whatever it is, like uh, fishing in the morning and hunting in the afternoon and mm-hmm. reading poetry in the uh, evening. So that, that sounds like uh, not even a fully post-work utopia, but like maybe a, an abundance right. diminished work utopia, right. uh, plus a sort of vision of social cultural uh, utopia, I guess. Right, right. Nick, let's switch and look uh, really long term and very visionary, uh, what I call your approach to ultimate utilitarianism. Um, I, I love this section, a quantitative analysis of the potential for happiness or fulfillment for all sentient beings if uh, if the cosmic endowment could be maximally uh, saturated with sentience. Uh, so some of the numbers you give, you estimate uh, 10 to the 35th possible human lives derived from human lives originating on Earth to, to populate the observable universe. That's, uh, I think, 100 billion, trillion, trillion. That's your minimum. Then you go up to 10 to the 43rd. And then if you switch to digital lives, which adds a lot of uh, uh, complex value, you get a computing power of the universe of at least 10 to the 58th, which is 10 billion, trillion, 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 four trillions there, um, in terms of uh, ultimate sentience. So um, what I love the calculation, but walk me through the, the importance of that in our uh, ultimate thinking, and also in terms of uh, of, of the concept of, of meaning and purpose, which is the purpose of your book. Well, uh, I mean, it's like some big number, basically, a very big number. But um, I mean, it, it's in in the context of the book, it's a little handout for some post from Gisad. Right, like right, right. But um, um, yeah, so I'm not. A utilitarian, I'm often mistaken for one because in some of my writings I have um, explored and analyzed the implications of assuming uh, an assumption of utilitarianism or aggregative consequentialism mm-hmm. uh, because it's a view that, you know, um, a significant fraction of, of moral philosophers have held and that I think maybe deserves at least some weight, even if one doesn't actually embrace it. And then it's interesting to see what follows if one actually takes that perspective seriously. Um, and hence in my earlier work, this, um, you know, the focus on existential risks as, as those few things that could actually permanently destroy our future. If, if one counts these possible future lives uh, the same way as actually currently existing lives, as, as certain flavors of utilitarianism would do, then they just seem to dominate and, and you get a bunch of interesting. And, and then there's like a further complication on that, which is if you, you know, literally do this, try to do this expected utility calculation, you find that scenarios in which somehow, even if they are very unlikely, but somehow infinite values could be realized. Like maybe we are wrong about physics and there's like some actual way of producing infinite, but then those tend to dominate even if they have a very, very tiny finite. And then you get into infinitarian paralysis and there's like a whole, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's interesting in its own right, but it's not really the topic of the book, um, um, which more focuses on not, not how you aggregate big values or what our obligations are, but like from our point of view, like what would be the best possible future for Robert, or or for the for you, the uh, the viewer, um, or for any of us, like if you literally could imagine the best possible way for your future life to unfold, and and perhaps we restricted by like the laws of physics, etc. But and and then trying to think from the inside, like how, how we would furnish that life with activity, experiences, relationships, etc. Mm. Um, and uh, then ultimately, like. You know, if, if your question is what you should you do now as a moral actor, then you would have to somehow integrate all these different perspectives, um, you know, whatever weight you would put on utilitarian views or deontological views or virtue ethics views and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but the, yeah, the book doesn't really try to pick between these different moral theories. Uh, it doesn't really, in general, focus so much on numbers or on formal structures and aggregation, but more try to sort of 
which often is done in contemporary analytic ethics. It kind of almost sees the values a little bit like black box. And that might not be exactly right, but this tries to look from the inside on, on the values, which values do you actually have, like at the object level, um, and what would it take to realize them? Um, I'm not sure whether that answers your question, but uh, um, now th there is this, yeah, I guess, I guess like one, um, one way in which th this larger view of the bigness of the future um, could do and does come into the book is insofar as we value significance, like having significant impact on the world, for example, if that's the version of significance. Right now, it looks like we have, we are extraordinarily well positioned to have huge impact on the world because, um, well, A, there's a lot of just ordinary needs in the world and, and you as an, you know, if, um, you know, if, if we imagine you're like a relatively well-off person with, with health and intelligence in a wealthy country with a good education, like probably most of your viewers are, uh, you have a lot of opportunity just to help a bunch of people and to try to make some positive difference. So that already gives your life potential significance that is maybe greater than one human life's worth of significance. Like you could save many people's lives or, but then on top of that, you have this idea that maybe we are on near a big fulcrum of human history, where if, if this whole thing, the AI transition and the rest of it is going to happen perhaps within our lifetime, then like you can multiply that manifold, right? Like if, if you could even slightly nudge this big future in the right direction, that would give your life even more causal significance. Um, this is one thing that might be a lot harder for people living in utopia to have this kind of significance, because if all the problems are already solved and whatever problems aren't yet solved are anyway much better worked at by uh, AIs, then humans might not be able to have significance in that sense. And so to the extent that one thinks it makes a life itself better to have this kind of significance, these utopian lives might lack that significance and therefore have a deficit of that particular value. Um, and so there's a discussion around that. And also the possibility of, of uh, humans, whether through AI, colonizing uh, or filling the universe with sentience is, is a, you know, gigantic grand vision. Um, yeah, I mean, if that's... If, if, if that's the way one wants to go. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I actually happen to think the future is big enough that you could not just realize one vision, but many. Uh, not every vision, because some are directly in conflict, but if some people think doing something nice for existing people and working locally uh, is the most important thing, we could certainly do that. And then also that leaves all the rest of the universe and that's big enough that you could have sort of AI paradise in one sector <laughs> and, you know, animal uplift uh, in another sector and you could have a whole bunch of different, to, to the extent that a, a vision doesn't require the negative, like the absence of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. but, and just the addition of new things, that, that would be easy to do. The harder questions become when, when like one thing says that another shouldn't exist and vice versa, and then you would have to strike some compromise that will give each of them less than a hundred percent of what the way they think would be the best. There's, a, there's enough room out there that both can be accommodated. Uh, yeah. In real and, and I think this is actually quite important. It's not really the focus of this book, but having, I think in general, as we will be wrestling with, for example, how to relate to the digital minds, the AIs that we create. Um, uh, having this sense of g g expansive generosity and like feeling that there is room for a lot and we shouldn't push too hard to get a hundred percent of one value, but we should try first to sort of give all reasonable value systems like uh, a, a good deal of satisfaction. And that, then at, uh, after that, we can squabble about the remains like, <laughs> but uh, because that, that seems like such a, if, if, if we solve these practical problems, uh, there's so, so much, um, so much opportunity there. And I think that increases the chances of, uh, that the value, that the, the future goes well in the first place. Um, Nick, I'd like to just do some expansive thinking, um, in terms of your book, you've positioned it very well in terms of its objective, in terms of human values. Uh, but the, uh, the, the assumption, the basic foundation of the book of a solved world and the conditions for that, 
and the implications uh, lead to many other questions which are beyond the book, but I'd like to just put them to you for, for um, because they occurred to me and I'm sure to many people um, and, and see, see where we go. So no, no order here, but when we talked about these huge numbers of filling the universe with uh, saturated with sentience, as I said, 10 to the 43rd or 58th uh, number of, 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 of sentient minds in one form or another. Uh, if that were to occur, and it is a handout uh, that Professor Bostrom gave to the students, which I, I lapped up. Um, if that would occur, what, what is your feeling about why that occurred? Is that just, would that just be a, a human tendency or would there be some universal trophism that's pulling um, that's self des desiring to be uh, self understanding and self aware in some sense. Uh, do you have any feeling about that? In other words, what what's the reason that that would happen? Um, yeah. Well, if we are imagining this astronomical entity of objects as being sort of human like minds, then I presume the most likely path. Uh, whereby that would happen is if humans shaped the future, and in particular, that was a strong influence of those humans who, who value this kind of future, like utilit broadly utilitarian uh, constituencies. And one might, it, it's possible that how many people would favor which moral theory will change, for example, if we became smarter or had AIs to advise us in our philosophizing. There might potentially be some convergence either towards or away from those conceptions. Um, I, it's uh, even on that conception, it's not clear that the right unit would be human minds, right? It might either either be smaller sure. if you think pleasure is somehow something that could be quantified. You know, maybe the most optimal structure for generating pleasure would be like a you know, why why do you need all of this 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 cortex and <laughs> like <laughs> visual like processing all of that? Maybe you just need some like kind of pruned down. Uh, neural structure, and and maybe it would be like some some animal. Maybe it's like optimize better optimized, and you would go further in that direction. Maybe pleasure boxes would would like you know have a different size than humans. If, if you imagine hedonium as matter uh, structured to be optimized for the instantiation of pleasure. Yeah, and and, um, and if you include digital pleasure, if if that's it, if that's would, not, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, I mean, it, it, in some sense, it doesn't really matter how big these would be if if they would be like a millimeter square or uh, like a, no. you know a light year right. square. But right. um, for other values, it's like well, you have to look at them one by one how they scale with resources. Um, so some values maybe have diminishing returns to extra resources. And this might be true for sort of typical individual human values, um, where, um, um, like, I mean, so, so most obviously with like wealth, for example, it's a much bigger deal if you're, if you go from 1000 a year to 2000 a year in income, huge difference. Uh, now if you go from like 1 million to 2 million, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's a thousand times bigger an increase and an equal in percentage terms, but probably you barely notice it. Like you get an extra summer house or whatever. It's not really. And so, so, so with current economic resources, they seem to have kind of steeply diminishing marginal returns insofar as they are spent by an individual to try to boost their own welfare. Mm. Um, with other values like knowledge, et cetera, you might think that there would be diminishing returns once we have already found the most important knowledge. And then we'd be sort of uh, spending increasing resources to discover smaller and smaller truths. Nick, uh, consciousness has come into our conversation and, and in the book in, um, in, in different, different fashions and in different ways. Um, is there a fundamental assumption in, in, as a worldview in, in a solved world? Does the paradigm, for example, require or assumes that consciousness is entirely physical, that it's the product of physical laws, irregularities, uh, uh, including the deep, deepest laws of physics, which may be unknown, but but still part of the physical world. Uh, is is that a an underlying assumption? Um, well, I mean, I'm a computationalist, uh, thinking that it's a structure of certain computations that produce um, 
and conscious experience. Uh, and those could be implemented on carbon-based organic brains or in principle on silicon processors or a, you know, in whatever yeah. substrate is capable of yeah. processing that information. Functionalism yeah. is that. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think that's really um, a, a, an essential premise for most of the book. I think there are little bits and pieces because I think this view is... Um, uh, yeah, uh, is so that, uh, but but I mean, basically, you could imagine. Um, I mean, clearly, if if our, but that would be a crazy view. Like, if you thought that what we do in this world has no effect on conscious experiences, then it, I guess the question would become purely philosophical, like a thought experiment. If you could, some if somehow this condition of a plastic world arose, then what would be our values in that world? But we would have no past towards it. But I think most people would think that clearly it has something to do with what happens in brains and our sensory organs and like clearly impacts the conscious experiences we have. And so then, even if you thought purely silicon entities could not have conscious experience, you could still have technologies that would make it possible to manipulate uh, the organic brains we have. Like we already have drugs. You could imagine surely slightly better drugs with fewer side effects and slightly other things that would at least allow us to approximate this condition um, of plasticity, even if perhaps not go, you know, the last 10% of the way there. As a functionalist and as a computational neuroscientist, computational mind approach, as you've said, it would seem that the concept of AI consciousness, in some sense, like our consciousness, is a certainty. It may not be within decades, it may take a long time, but uh, there doesn't seem to be any in principle inhibition to that, given that philosophical foundation. Is, is, is that is that fair? Yeah. Well. Um, well, first of all, um, I mean, a certainty is a strong claim with respect to any big philosophical question. Yeah, that's, I think. Why, that's why. You're uh, I, I, I don't have that level of. I mean, we just look, need to look at the history of philosophy with. Great thinkers disagree with one another, so at least some of them have been wrong about really important things, and perhaps all of them, but at least some, right? That we know. And, uh, so they all can't be right, but they all can. But 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 they uh, but they all can be wrong, right? They could all be wrong, but they can't all be right yeah. since they contradict one another. And so clearly, at the matter level, one has to have a lot of humility about one's views about any of these matters. Um, but um, even if we assume computationism, it's certainly not a given that future AIs actually will be conscious. It would just demonstrate that in principle they could be, but it might still require the design of certain kinds oh, of AIs. Oh, sure, sure. To realize that possibility. But I'm saying in, and, in principle, I'm, I'm putting a hard question to you. In principle, it is a certainty that AI could be conscious. Uh, how it's achieved and when it's achieved, that's completely uncertain. But if you're a computationalist and a functionalist, I, I think that you have to agree, you have to submit to that certainty. I mean, it, it certainly is an implication of functionalism or computationalism that AIs could, in principle, be conscious. Now, when I say that I'm a computationalist, I don't mean that I am certain of it, like because I could be wrong <laughs> yeah. about anything, and in particular that. Okay. But uh, I mean, it seems like one of the more uh, Amongst all the different philosophical views, uh, I'm more or less sure about a lot of things and that would come like higher up the end of philosophically controversial views that I feel convinced about, but certainly not like at 100% or anything like that. Okay. Uh, is AI consciousness part of a solved world or that's, that's a, uh, a tangential? Uh, I, I think it would be... Um, very likely part of the possibilities in a solved world that digital conscious minds could be created. I think it's one of the technological affordances at technological maturity to do this. Now, if I'm wrong about consequentialism, then you know it might still be true because you could then like maybe engineer minds through through bioengineering or something that would basically achieve the same thing. Mm. Um, now, I think most of the book would still stand even if somehow Agreed. you drop that from the package of assumptions of technological Agreed. maturity. Uh, next question is, is virtual immortality. Is, is that part of a solved world? Because a lifespan, um, again, I, I didn't, can't remember every single word, but I don't, 
I don't recall the lifespan of being a critical part of the of of the solved world, a hundred years or something. Uh, but uh, in a solved world, one might think there's physical immortality, and then uh, the concept of virtual immortality. Yeah, well, I mean, immortality is a long time. Uh, <laughs> um, and, I mean, if we mean literally never dying, that is possibly physically impossible. I mean, given you know, the heat death of the universe, etc. Right, sure. Um, but uh, if we are talking just about, say, uh, extreme life extension, I certainly don't think there is any law of nature that says that humans can only live for 80 years or 100 years or whatever. Like w w once you achieve the ability to continuously repair damage that occurs um, and then maybe reduce accident risk, certainly many thousands of years would be trivial. And if you could upload into computers, then your software, which could just be kind of error checked and uh, redundantly stored, et cetera, and you could have astronomical lifespans. The question in that context becomes not so much whether you could keep sort of the physical substrate alive and functioning, but more what does it mean for if, if you want to retain a human-like mind? I mean, you can keep learning for 100 years and presumably for 200 years, right? But after 200,000 years, we don't really know whether the human mind would just kind of go stale and rigid and eventually become kind of non-human. Mm. Um, if, if you want to continue to develop and learn and change from experience the, the way we currently do, which might seem really part of what it means to be human, it might be that if you continue doing that over a sufficiently large time scale, you eventually become something non-human. Mm. Mm. Uh, like that might retain some of your earlier humanity in it, just like you retain something of your five-year-old self, but it's still, you're not, I mean, you're in some sense the same person, but in some sense also a different, different. person. And I think similarly, that we might become like post-human versions of ourselves right. over really, really long uh, timescales. Nick, two things about the book that intrigued me randomly. I just want to ask you quickly. Uh, the first is you made a com comment that consciousness is not necessary for moral status. Uh, that surprised me. Yeah, so um, I, I'm inclined to that view. I'm not fully confident, but it's particularly relevant in the context of digital minds. Uh, and, and maybe even subhuman digital minds, like ones we are currently building or the, like the next generation of the current AI systems or beyond. Um, I think consciousness would be sufficient for moral status. If you could suffer, that, that would mean that it matters how you're treated. But um, it seems possible to me that a digital mind, even if it doesn't have that, but say it has a conception of self as existing through time, um, it's a really sophisticated mind, it, uh, it has preferences, maybe life goals. It can form relationships with uh, human beings, reciprocal uh, friendships, etc. I think in that case, um, my intuition would strongly be that there would be ways of treating it that would be wrong. Mm. And so that it would have moral patience, even if it weren't conscious. And it could have those characteristics without having consciousness? Yeah. I mean, so those characteristics are all functionally defined. These are sort of behaviors and dispositions, uh -huh. et cetera. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, it might be that depending on how uh, willing you are to ascribe conscious experiences to different kinds of systems, maybe you would ascribe conscious experience. But I would say even conditionalizing on it not having conscious experiences, if it had those attributes, it would be a strong okay, candidate. That, that's, for a, a, that's an interesting position. Um, near the end, you introduced the concept of enchantment. Uh, why? It seemed like another example of these um, quiet values, like the kind of star constellations that <laughs> uh, are, are a little bit um, uh, hidden from us in our current sort of um, brutish condition of, of grave needs and desperation. But um, that could come into view if we solve a lot of the practical problems. Um, and one of the things that, if it's missing, I think might make a possible future uh, condition look less attractive to us. If you take the extreme example of the absence of enchantment, imagine some future in which, uh, so this is not a utopia at all, but like just consider if you were sitting in a chamber and your job consisted of pressing uh, like maybe you were presented with some analytic problem in a little text bubble and then you had to think hard and engage all your mental faculties use your knowledge and creativity all of that would be there 
and then you sort of output the answer and then you get as a reward um a, a pleasure palette that also gave you your neutrons and, yeah. and you, you sort of shortcut our rich interactions with reality and simplify it to a purely analytic exercise where all that matters is kind of whether you choose action a b or c so you'd still have causal impact you'd still have to use a lot of your human capacities but something would seem to be missing i call this enchantment so right now when we are in the world all the different parts of us are relevant and engaged so in addition to your abstract decision you have intuitive de decisions right you have emotions you have to control and manage you have body language you have <laughs> a physiology you have legs and like and we interact with other people we don't just perceive whether they choose a b and c we sort of perceive we have a much higher bandwidth interface with reality and so that's i'm, I'm trying to gesture because this value hasn't really been characterized but i think with a few more examples like that one can get an intuitive sense there is something there that if that weren't there then plausibly this this future would be deficient so Nick, let's have some fun. I'm going to ask you some very big questions and ask you, beg you for some very short answers. And let's see what happens. So first, what are the percentages for the following scenarios for AI superintelligence in the next 100 years? I picked 100 years. So here's the percentage. Some really bad events would occur that AI will do substantial damage to humanity. Percentage, zero to 100 like my p doom as they call it now yeah, yeah. i don't know I've, I've punted on this in the past um i think it's like um certainly um very non-trivial um it depends partly on what we do the degree to which we get our act together but partly i think it's also baked in um P percentage a number i'm listening for a number well uh, uh, uh the the percentage um won't hold you to it no, but other people might. <laughs> range. Give me a habit of range. Non-trivial is, is. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, it seems like a bit, a bit bigger than five percent and lower than ninety-five percent. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, that, that's we made some progress, like on the twin twin prime uh, subject to revision. Okay. All right. How about? I mean, a lot depends. Yeah. Uh, I mean, bad things are going to happen by to, to humans by default anyway. I mean, we all kind of either get cancer or heart disease or get shot or <laughs> Alzheimer's or something else um, over a hundred year time scale. And so um, the, the the default is that we are all kind of going into the uh, the slaughterhouse. Um, and the, the question is like, how low does the chance have to be before one is it would be willing to take a gamble on something different. That's one question. Um, but then I think there also, this would get beyond our current short form format, uh, uh, questions about how I, our AIs relate to other AIs out there in the infinite universe that are already established. Okay. Um, so let, let's, let's go on. Fine. Good. Um, uh, so, some aspect of the utopian outcomes, exactly the opposite that AI say large does away largely with all work in a hundred years what's the likelihood of that zero to a hundred so conditional and ai being developed or just uh whatever assumption yep yeah. uh, uh well conditional and it being developed yeah i mean that that, that i mean all, all work with the exception of work that where there is a specific demand that it be performed by human or where the consumer cares about the process uh, and and um, with the asterisk that yeah um, uh, okay these are really hard like I think you you're doing the mistake of trying to ask a philosopher to be uh, very concise <laughs> uh, uh, um, I just see like an avalanche of considerations and qualifications and levels um, for each of these very complex questions okay <laughs> All right. next question. <clears throat> percentage of a catastrophic human event dealing with uh, uh, existential risks to humanity before 2050. I'm not saying elimination of all human beings like a huge asteroid, but some huge catastrophic event. Well, I, I think there are catastrophic events all the time. Uh, 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 something that would uh, would decimate, would 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 kill 
a large percentage of humanity or eliminate. You've dealt so much with existential risk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so existential risk is a subset, right? Where you actually permanently destroy the future. Um, and then I guess it depends a little on how, like, how, how, how many people do you have to decimate? Like, so <laughs> if you like COVID is like uh, whatever, half a percent or something, and then it goes up from there. Yeah, no, I, I'd say a bigger number, you know, 50% of humanity. Very. I mean, most likely I think we'd either not have that or we have an existential catastrophe that or something very close to like 50 percent is a kind of weirdly intermediate number i mean it could happen some some pandemic engineered pandemic right um yeah, maybe or or maybe a thermonuclear but like engineered pandemic is probably the most likely way that 50 percent of us die okay. in the next uh, couple of decades okay a little bit into your your total uh, uh work uh, the percentage that our universe is a simulation i don't know if you've ever said that is <laughs> you think you're gonna get my probability many have tried so far none has succeeded and uh, so I'm... you shall not be the first <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. Do you think there is at least one solved world in the observable universe? Um, in the observable universe, mm -hmm. no. Uh, I mean, unless yeah, unless, unless the simulation hypothesis is true, in which case the question becomes a bit wonky. Right. Right. Um, but, I mean, I, I don't think there is any in the observable universe. I mean, the observable universe. I think most likely intelligent life is uh, uh, low density, so there might be infinitely much of it, but within any small finite region like the observable universe, it might just be so unlikely for it to evolve in the first place that we are alone, uh, which would account for the Fermi paradox. Right. That's an important uh, issue that we deal with, and that's a, that's a good, very good perspective. Um, AI consciousness, uh, true in a, a, awareness, uh, what's your odds on that uh, happening within uh, a conceivable a thousand years? Is, is that a high likelihood? Um, yeah, uh, conditional on us not going extinct before. I mean, in fact, I wouldn't be confident we don't already have it in some AI systems. Hmm. Okay, um, that's a... I think... As you zoom in on the concept of consciousness, this might be for another uh, conversation, yeah. but I, I think it becomes, it's a lot more multidimensional and vague than the naive view would have it. And so okay. the question might be less binary than one, one supposes. Virtual immortality of our first person consciousness, is that in principle possible? Um, well, certainly uh extreme longevity as in like whatever thousands or millions of years yes yes uh, immortality as in never dying depends on physics which currently looks like it would uh, not admit of I infinite information processing streams so virtual uh, uploading of our first person conscious is not not as a duplicate yeah. where it's like a um, a very sharp identical twin but literally my first person consciousness is uh, you yeah, yeah. yeah it is uh it is in principle uh, possible. Right. I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, is life in the universe a, a happy accident or is life somehow built into the ultimate laws of physics? Um, I mean, both could be true. Uh, it, it might be the, it's built in that for any planet, it's, it, there's an extremely low chance of it happening. And then it might also be built in that there are enough planets that statistically it will happen on an astronomical or infinite number of planets. Um, How prevalent is life and mind in the universe? You've said already that it is very rare. Uh, is it, there a possibility that uh, we are alone in terms of intelligent mind? In the observable universe, I think that's a very real possibility. But of course, if the universe is infinite, as it looks like it is, then uh, with probability one, 
uh, there, there would be infinitely many of these places where intelligent life yeah, has a risk. Uh, and then if you introduce the simulation, then it becomes more complex to answer it. But yeah. Yeah, yeah no, simulation is, is actually self-solving in that, in that in, to some of the questions. Uh, infinite universe, anything that's possible will happen an infinite number of times. And so the question becomes, becomes very vague. Last question. Uh, does anything exist not explainable in terms of ultimate physics? Um, so yeah, it, like I think for uh, something to be ex explainable could mean two different things. One is that it sort of supervenes on the laws of physics, yes. um, which maybe is what you have in mind. Uh, well then, yeah, the laws of physics in our universe, uh, I think that could be a lot of things that don't supervene on them. If we are in a simulation, there would be other layers of reality, which would have their own laws of physics, et cetera. Um, it, in our observable universe, it looks like everything supervenes on the laws of physics. doesn't mean it's explainable in the sense that there is like a useful, intelligible, you know, 10 page text that would like make you more informed by talking about basic physics. Like if you're trying to understand some cultural phenomena, you would, you wouldn't start writing out the quantum equations or something. Uh, Nick, this has been terrific. Um, I wish we could go on forever. We'll definitely do this uh, uh, sooner than another 17 years. Yeah, I, pro oh, yeah. I promise yeah. that. Uh, Deep Utopia is a fantastic book, recommended for everybody. It is a um, a vision for the future, but more than that, it more than that, it's really an understanding of what uh, what the meaning of human life can be, and it reflects on what we think of our own values. So we can go on. Viewers can watch hundreds of TV episodes and exclusive videos on cosmos, life, cosmology, and meaning on the Closer to Truth website and Closer to Truth YouTube channel, including, of course, those of Nick Bostrom. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.